Welcome back to The Breakdown with me, NLW. It's a daily podcast on macro, Bitcoin, and the big picture power shifts remaking our world. The Breakdown is sponsored by NYDIG and produced and distributed by Coindesk. What's going on, guys? It is Monday, July 5th. Now, technically, this is when the July 4th holiday is recognized. So Coindesk is out. And at first, I was thinking maybe I would just have to not have a show. But a couple of weeks ago, I hosted a webinar with Circle for Coindesk. The conversation was about institutions coming to DeFi. I've said before, and I'll say it again, that ultimately for me, the breakdown is a show about power. And the reason that I focus more on Bitcoin than other parts of the crypto markets is that I think Bitcoin has undeniably taken a seat at the power shift table. I've been watching, however, to see if DeFi in particular starts to take on a similar role, at least in narratives and discussions. Part of that is about how the government looks at it, and this week clearly we saw more focus from a regulatory perspective on DeFi. But part of it is also how institutions, these big traditional financial behemoths, are looking at the space. I think the verdict is still out, I think it's still early, but I think that this conversation with Jeremy, if you're interested in such questions, is a really good primer and a really good snapshot of this moment in time. Now, one thing I want to be clear about is that this was a paid partnership between Circle and Coindesk. This is not editorial content, it's sponsored content. But I also want to be clear that in no way was I obligated to put this on the show. Circle didn't expect or pay for this to be a part of the breakdown. That's a type of sponsorship I've never been comfortable with. It was entirely my decision instead to play this for this holiday episode because I was just genuinely enthusiastic about how the conversation turned out. If you have any more questions about that, feel free to hit me up on Twitter at NLW and I'm glad to answer them. But for now, if you are interested in the state of institutions coming into DeFi and the questions that remain, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Jeremy Allaire. Today, we are talking about bringing DeFi to institutions. I'm joined by Jeremy Allaire from Circle, and I'm so excited to have you here. Jeremy, how's it going? Hey, it's good. I'm super excited for this topic. The bull run that we are either in a pause of or at the end of or wherever you think the market cycle is, was so shaped by, from a narrative and a real perspective, the introduction of institutions into this space. It was something that we've been talking about for years, and then it actually started to really happen. Uh, Institutions meaning a whole bunch of different things, which I think is part of what we're going to unpack here. But I think it is this big question about what happens next? As institutions dig deeper into the space, what do they explore? Do they stay solely interested in Bitcoin and what might be built there? Is it just a kind of treasury reserve asset for them? Or is there a a broader change that crypto markets might signal and shift? So that's what we're going to talk about today. And maybe to kick off, let's talk about what we mean when we say institutions. Yeah, this is a great topic, something we're thinking a ton about and really timely. You know, I, I think when people talk about institutions in in the context of crypto, they're almost always trying to make reference to sort of um, institutional investors, right? So it's sort of when do asset managers and pension funds and endowments and all this, when do they come in and buy crypto assets? That's sort of been the overall meaning of institutions when the institutions get involved. And and that is that has been part of the the theme here, which is you know a few notable corporations putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet or bigger and bigger financial institutions enabling trading of different crypto derivatives or whatever that institute those institutional indicators are, and that's one view, which is institutional investing in the you know blue chip cryptos like Bitcoin and and Ethereum, right? And if you actually look at what institutions are doing, that's a lot of it now. To me institutions, and, and I think we'll, we'll talk about this in the context of DeFi, but to me, the institutions is something much, much, much larger than that. And it's essentially the question of, will every corporation in the world, every organization in the world connect to digital currency infrastructure? Will they connect to it and use it and use it as a part of the way that they store value, move value, et cetera, And will they use it as a capital market? At the end of the day, capital markets, what we think of, whether it's stocks and bonds and debt and all this sort of stuff that floats around, you know, corporate debt, 
companies borrowing capital to fund building a plant or whatever you're doing and, and so on. That's the real world, like businesses interacting with the financial system, which accounts for an enormous amount of it. That's institutions. And so to me, the question is, when does that happen? When do businesses writ large, institutions writ large, actually begin to integrate to this and rely on this as part of their overall treasury and part of how they, how they operate? So there's, to me, there's two big things. There's institutional investors, and that's basically people who are essentially just long-term holders, speculators, traders, whatever that would be in, in terms of that. And then there's institutional adoption of crypto financial market infrastructure, crypto treasury infrastructure, crypto payments infrastructure for the actual business of business, so to speak. So within that framework, um, where I want to go next is who's looking for what and how DeFi offers that. But I think before that, I'd love to just get a sense of where your perception is of where people are on the adoption cycle. Are they allocating? Are they building? Are they on the edge looking in? Are they way far away, but they've got one ear tuned in this direction? And maybe if there's different types of uh, of these actors that fit kind of different parts of that profile, just give us a landscape as we go into, you know, kind of more precise questions about what they're interested in. Yeah. I mean, I, I think right now the the interest from from businesses and institutions is fairly broad and it's fairly nascent. Let, let's Let's sort of speak realistically here. Like, there's been some high profile public companies that put Bitcoin on their balance sheets, but it's pretty limited, right? There are more and more asset management firms that, that have some kind of strategy around this, but it's still relatively nascent. You know, so, and, and when we talk about DeFi specifically, institutional participation in DeFi, I think is extremely limited right now. Like getting an institution comfortable with the idea that you could go to a regulated exchange purchase a, a, a digital commodity that's very clearly been sort of said is a legitimate form of commodity by US regulators and owning it and having it put with some bank like custodian and you know that kind of thing like that's sort of where the comfort level is but you know actively uh, allocating capital into yield farming of like long tail crypto tokens there aren't a lot of institutions doing that um, whether on the investment institutional investor side of things or on the certainly on the corporate side of things. I think corporations, if, if I'm a corporate treasurer and I'm looking at this today, I may personally have bought some Bitcoin, but I'm curious about this. I'm hearing a lot about it, but I'm extremely intimidated about what this is. It just feels dangerous and risky and like kind of nuts. It's kind of science fiction. And so to, to that world, it's there. However, one of the things that we've been seeing, and it's, it's really in, interesting to see, is for many corporate treasurers, and, and that includes like some, like the treasurer of a bank's balance sheet, for example, they're having a hard time getting their head wrapped around allocating some of their balance sheet into, into something like Bitcoin. But they're seeing yield markets that have emerged where there's dollar denominated, dollar supplied and dollar delivered yield, stablecoin yield, that is really attractive, you know, whether in a DeFi market protocol or through, through CFI. And so all of a sudden you have businesses that are saying, well, okay, I don't want to necessarily buy Bitcoin, but I'm happy to have some form of indexed exposure to it that gives me a four or 5%, 6% APY and I'm just shifting dollars away from a money market and into a, a stablecoin yield product, that actually feels a lot more comfortable to a, an institution in many senses than taking principal risk directly in a cryptocurrency. We're seeing that in terms of the, just, just in terms of like the inbound institutional interest in this, for the first time we're seeing, you know, people who, who are, you know, CFOs or treasurers of regular way corporations saying, I'm interested in 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 look and looking at at these stablecoin denominated yields that are happening. So it's super interesting. I mean, we're going to get more into this, but I think there's an obvious technological barrier to entry that is. I mean, it feels insurmountable for individuals in many cases, not just corporations and institutions. Um, yeah. But it sounds like in some cases there may actually be a. Uh, 
motivational, philosophical, less of a barrier to entry than, than certain sort of like spot buying of assets, which right. feels more like at least an assessment of the macro landscape and an attempt to do something different versus just kind of doing the normal thing that businesses do, which is go out and hunt for yield. So I guess right. that's that's a perfect segue maybe into the question of, you know, given that as you've articulated, this is still very nascent. What do you believe the uses that, you know, those people that are starting to sniff around this area are most interested in? How much is it looking for yield? You know, that pure, simple thing. How much of it is speculating on future value? How much of it is lowering costs, cutting out intermediaries, trying to speed things up? You know, like where are the different dimensions falling as you're seeing it in conversations? Yeah, I mean, again, there's not like a uniform uniform view on this because businesses that are getting involved in this it's, it's fascinating to see because, you know, Circle sits on both the kind of payment infrastructure side of this and we sit on the kind of treasury infrastructure side and the yield side and, and, and that. So we, we kind of see a lot of different angles on this. And so on the one hand, we're seeing more and more, you know, um, you know small and medium enterprises who have figured out that stable coins as a settlement medium are, are really efficient. And who are saying, I want to get set up with this because people want to pay me with this, or I want to accept payments with this. And, and maybe these are business owners and entrepreneurs and startups and others who themselves are actively active in the crypto markets. And so they're all of a sudden saying, wow, this is really powerful. We should just use this in our business. You're starting to see big companies that have big, complex global supply chains that deal with suppliers in emerging markets all around the world who are saying dollar stable coins actually look like an attractive way to to distribute payments uh, around the world and and then you know you kind of it leads into these conversations where the, the businesses are saying talk to me about these yields the 3% 4% 5% 6% or whatever those yields are talk to me about those yields what is that what's the risk of that What's involved with that? How do I do that? So you're absolutely seeing more businesses who are kind of looking at this um, from those two sides. Like, how do I get utility value out of this? And what's the business benefit of parking capital here? You know, that's emerging. And then clearly you have businesses and institutions who are entirely about just ch- chasing the money, so to speak. They're just entirely mm-hmm. about you know, this is an investment, right? How do, I, how do I treat this as an investment? I've got a thesis on the investment. I'm, I'm either taking a long position on an asset or, I'm, or I, I, I want to actively trade an asset or um, I, I want indexed exposure to an asset class. And so that's a whole category as well. But it's a pretty, it's a pretty broad spectrum of what's kind of bringing people to it. And I think our thesis is that over time, as in particular, as, as DeFi infrastructure matures, it can just be a very, very efficient form of capital market that every business can tap into in the same way that they do today indirectly through banks and commercial banks that then intermediate capital markets on their behalf. I think that more and more, it'll be about businesses perhaps working through financial technology firms that are intermediating DeFi on their behalf, but where they're more direct market participants in the capital markets themselves, which is ultimately, I think, the promise of, of DeFi is that market participants can face each other in a much more efficient, direct way uh, without the traditional kind of rent seeking. That was a, a very eloquent and like clear eyed way to say all of the above in terms of what, uh, <laughs> what people are interested in, which, which I think makes sense. I, I think in a, in a lot of ways, it sounds like what the key question is less like what is the door that they walk through, but how it helps them journey down this path of understanding all of these different pieces and how the sort of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. And, and you know, I, I, for, for, for many businesses and, and, and business owners and institutions, like it's the blind man with the elephant. It's like, wow, there's this over here and there's this over here. And I'm, I'm, I'm like just get, getting my head wrapped around it. As we, we all in, in crypto land, you know, talk about going down the rabbit hole and rabbit holes are big and, and complex and endless and confusing and, and everything else. And, you know, so being down the rabbit hole is, it, it's, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot to discover. And I think there's this process of discovery certainly going on 
for, for, for more and more businesses that are trying to get involved in this now. The Breakdown is sponsored by NYDIG, the institutional grade platform for Bitcoin. As longtime listeners know, NYDIG is a major force in the Bitcoin space, and they're now making it possible for thousands of banks who have trusted relationships with hundreds of millions of customers to offer Bitcoin. That mainstream access is critical for all of us, and you can learn more about it at nydig.com slash NLW. That's N-Y-D-I-G dot com forward slash NLW. We're coming up on a year now of the anniversary of DeFi Summer, which was obviously a, a seminal moment in terms of expansion uh, of of kind of the the infrastructure in this space, the assets, the things you can do, the I mean the value. You know, it's crazy to think that a year ago at this time, or I guess at the beginning of this month, there's sort of less than a billion locked in, in these protocols. Yeah, to to see where we are now. I guess what over that year in the context of these institutions has been the most significant in terms of the infrastructure build out? I mean, I, I think um, in, in, in many ways we've seen the major protocols, right? So the, the, these, if you go back to like 2018, when a lot of these protocol projects were just getting started, 2017 even, but 2018 in particular, you know, these were pretty simple. And what we've seen over the last year is, you know, multiple significant infrastructure upgrades to DeFi market infrastructure, both exchange infrastructure, and then more and more like variability in terms of um, encapsulation on top of those, you've seen huge infrastructure improvements in the way in which these are run and operated and governed. I mean, that's been one of the extraordinary stories is that this is community owned and operated, if you will, market infrastructure. You know, it, it, it's like the traditional exchanges where you have a seat at the exchange um, governing the New York Stock Exchange or the CME or, or whatever, but this is like totally democratized and you've got governance models and you've got successful risk management upgrades, protocol upgrades, um, you know, really, really extraordinary. And now, you know, I, I think that the next big thing is we're now really starting to see at an infrastructure level, you know, the, the, the scalability upgrades, right? So I think during the, the crypto bull market, we had these periods of enormous expense and, and gas fees. And it was sort of like, why would I ever try and save a hundred dollars into compound protocol if it cost me a hundred dollars to put my hundred dollars in, right? Or, or, or these kinds of like, this is absurd. And so, you know, you, that's been the latest cycle has been, you know, watching protocol after protocol after protocol deploy on level twos, completely, you know, clean room ecosystems be built up on new third generation chains, like the whole Serum ecosystem built up on Solana and high performance DEXs that can execute central limit order books in the same way that a centralized exchange can. So we've seen like fundamental infrastructure improvements. We've seen protocol improvements, we've seen governance improvements, and, and just like a constant set of iteration in terms of higher level protocols that encapsulate all of this. So I just I just feel like it's been, it's kind of been like relentless um, improvement going on. And now that the treasuries on these projects are, are quite robust, and the, you know, I think huge numbers of firms kind of around this, you know, firms like Circle, but dozens and dozens and dozens of other firms around this that are very well capitalized, the, the build out from here, I think is super exciting. I mean, it, it's super exciting. And, and, and I think a lot of people are now going from, okay, we, we've sort of created this infrastructure for crypto tokens as a, as a broad asset class. How do we expand this into other things? How do we take this infrastructure and apply it to the rest of the world and make capital markets that are, you know, dramatically larger capital markets than are served with the legacy exchange market infrastructure. Yeah, DeFi eating other aspects and other assets is something I want to come back to. But I guess I'd love to bring it back a little bit more um, temporal to where we are now, right? So yeah. obviously you're looking at this from an extremely long duration point of view in terms of the implications, in terms of the types of actors that you want, you, you think are going to come in. 
let's talk, I guess, what, about what's happening right now from a price market cycle perspective. Were you surprised that there wasn't a DeFi phase to this bull after Bitcoin hit all-time highs and then Ethereum hit all-time highs? Has it impacted the enthusiasm that you're seeing or the interest coming in from outside? Just kind of like wh- how does where we are now, you know, one, what, what's your assessment of it? And two, yeah. does it impact any of this or is it just kind of a short-term uh, part of the growth? Well, I mean, I, I think there, there, there has been a massive DeFi phase to this. I, I know that if you look at media coverage and attention, obviously, it's all about the price of Bitcoin or the price of Ether and, and things like this. But obviously, you know, there was a giant alt season. Um, and beyond that, DeFi, you know, governance tokens have, have, you know, have grown dramatically. I mean, if you, if you, if they didn't even exist a little over a year ago, there were no DeFi governance tokens. Um, and, and so now whether it's uni or comp or, you know, YFI, like go, go down the list, right. DeFi um, protocol tokens are, 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 have grown to a very, very significant scale market cap. And you could argue that many of the next generation blockchain infrastructures like Solana or Polkadot, just giving a couple of examples, um, are fundamentally kind of DeFi, right? They're, they're fundamentally people who are investing in it because they believe that so much of DeFi can get built on these as well. And so I, I feel like there has been a huge amount there. The fact that major crypto brokerages now enable average investors to, to invest in these too is, is significant. So I, I do feel like there's been a lot there. Um, o- o- over this period, um, but it's still amongst the broader population of people who are who, who think about this space. Like, if you go meet with your average person who's maybe bought some Bitcoin or whatever, all this stuff is like still kind of Greek to them, um, and so it, it certainly it do- doesn't have quite the the same uh, you know awareness and adoption. So you mentioned Solana, Polkadot, Ethereum, sort of a, a you know a slew of different ecosystems in which DeFi is growing up in parallel. How much do you think the DeFi sort of or the institutional move into DeFi will be cross chain? Care about that? You know, what are the trade offs that you think people will ultimately care about in terms of decentralization, efficiency, speed? I mean, you know, where, how yeah. does this all shake out? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a larger question about how you see the evolution of the space as a whole, but yeah. I think particularly through the lens of what might matter to this set of actors. I mean, a, a, a given business or institutional market participant or whatever, like at the end of the day, they don't actually really care what the specific infrastructure is, right? They, they care about what it does. Um, and I think a, a fundamental premise of what makes some of these infrastructures really successful is the you know, programmable money, i.e. composable you know, Lego money bricks, whatever metaphor you want to use, but basically the composability of, of all these different protocols and smart contracts and the like. And so certainly businesses care about like, what's the ecosystem I'm basically plugging into and therefore that has higher market value, utility value, wh- whatever that might be. So that's something that they, they certainly care about. But then it comes down to, you know, the people who are building this set of market infrastructure, the people who are building these innovations, what do they care about? Well, they do care about performance, scalability, cost efficiency. And I think this is what the whole industry is up against right now. And this is a huge, huge thing, which is the move from centralization to decentralization and and doing that at internet scale. And, you know, if you listen to Sam Bankman-Fried talk about this, you know, and and think about this is what is it going to take to have an infrastructure that can do a million transactions per second, that can do web scale kind of compute and and information transmission and and transaction throughput, like that's what we're up against because if we really want this to be something that a billion people are using or 2 billion people are using, we have to to get there. And so all of DeFi and Web3 is up against that set of physics limitations, if you will. And, you know, I, I think for... For this to really be, you know, let, let, let's say this vision of, uh, of these 
you know, extraordinarily diverse long tail capital markets that can serve every asset in the world and that every individual and every institution can plug into. And it's this beautiful machinery that, that people are out interacting with to do that at scale. We're just nowhere close right now. And so I think, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the past market cycles, it was sort of like we, ha we had a market cycle. There's a lot of aspiration. There are a lot of new projects started and then reality set in and then there's a lot of building, right? And I think, you know, this time around, there's the the reality is much firmer. It's much greater, but and but the building is continuing. And so I, I really think what institutions are looking for is scale, capital efficiency, and usability. Um, those are huge, huge things. And and frankly, the ability to interact with this infrastructure in a trusted way, and the ability to interact with this infrastructure in a legally compliant way. And I know a lot of people in Decentral DeFi don't wanna hear about the legally compliant issues, but if you want this to be used by everyday, every way businesses around the world, you have to figure that out. You have to figure out a way to connect real world identity, real world entities to face each other in these markets in, in, in some way as well. So let, let's talk about that because that feels like uh, a transition that could fundamentally change the shape of what we call DeFi. It could splinter DeFi into the DeFi that's KYC and the DeFi that's for anons with OPSEC. Like, you know, how does that transition play out? And I guess maybe let's broaden that question to ask what your sense of the regulatory landscape is, because we're dealing with a type of infrastructure that is, uh, I mean, it runs in parallel to a totally different set of rails that have history, that have clarity. You know, how how do you see regulators interacting with that? And then, you know, what are the, what are the risks in in that sort of yeah. uh, bringing regulators up to speed with it? Well, first of all, it's like it's absolutely critical that regulators be brought up to speed. It's never a winning game to just sort of go off and hide and hope that no one finds you, because um, that that that's not going to work. And the 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 scale of this just today, the scale of this is significant enough that major national governments are reacting in different ways. And so, you know, you, you have to go and educate. And what's interesting is that what's happening with the technology, what's happening with these market structures, are so so far ahead of where regulators are that that in and of itself is a risk because you can get, you know, if, if, if something truly bad happens, you could get an overreaction. That's always one of the, one of the concerns that, that one has. Right now, a lot of the regulatory focus is on identity compliance, financial crime risk, tax evasion, money laundering, terrorist financing, all this sort of stuff. And the, the answer is not to say, well, that's happening in the real world financial system. And so, you know, we've got blockchain analytics. It's all fine. Right. That, that's not a that's not a reasonable answer, um, which which sometimes is, is the answer that you hear from various participants. I think the, the concept of a capital market that is for borrowing and lending, trading and exchange liquidity of various financial instruments, the concept of all of these capital market functions existing on the public internet as autonomous software that just runs in the public domain, that hurts a regulator's head. It really hurts a regulator's head. They're like, what are you talking about? There's no company. This is just literally open source software that's literally just running on the public internet. And so it hurts their head. And the knee jerk reaction is that's insane. That can't be allowed to, to go on. Like we need to shut this down <laughs> right now. If you spend time with regulators and you, you kind of walk through it and explain it and say, this is a world where the, the, the efficiencies and the transparency and the risk management of this open blockchain system is going to improve the financial system. It's going to provide greater access around the world and actually greater transparency, greater auditability, greater understanding of risks and allow entities, whether they be people or businesses to directly participate and face each other through that. And that's going to improve the resilience of the economy. People go, oh, that sounds good. That, that, that's, that sounds like really exciting. But then it comes down to we, we need to know that people who are interacting through this are not 
breaking the law. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, and that the underlying, you know, kind of infrastructure is resilient, and we have a way of of sort of knowing that it's 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 resilient infrastructure, and that's where I think a lot of the questions are, and that's why simultaneously one of the biggest challenges is one of the biggest opportunities, which is if you can create a way for individuals and 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 institutions to kind of verify themselves and then flow capital in and out of these markets and know that they're dealing with and interacting with other verified individuals, then that will make this safer and it will make it something that a radically larger number of institutions will want to participate in. And that's how you go from what sounds like a really big market today to something that eats into the $350 trillion global equity and debt markets. So we, we have to make that progress. And that's what regulators are caring about. And I think that's ultimately a critical thing that, that the industry needs to solve broadly. So you got into this a little bit, but I just want to see if we can get it even, even more crisp, because I feel like this is a conversation that you're having a lot already, and you're going to have a lot more going forward. But let's say, let's hold aside solving for the no crime thing, right? That, that, that Which is a meaningful thing, but let's hold aside. Let's say that that's solved. Because that's sort of just like a, how does this exist in a way that doesn't screw up other things kind of a, an argument. Mm -hmm. What's the what's the cleanest, simplest argument for why this should be allowed to exist? What is the benefit to the economy for this to be allowed to continue to grow and reach maturity? Yeah, I you know, I think like this is where you have to kind of step back and it's very easy to get kind of caught up in this stuff as just like, wow, all these people making money with all these tokens and all this speculation and so on. And like, that's, that's very easy, but it's also kind of not the point of it. Right. I mean, it is the point of it for some people for sure, but like the financial system, the markets for capital are designed to support growth in the economy. They're designed to help societies raise prosperity. How do they do that? Well, they create ways to allocate capital. They enable you know, people who have capital to provide capital to people who need capital. They create very flexible ways for businesses and households to, uh, to generate value by investing it and lending it. Like capital markets are there to serve society. They're there to serve growth in businesses and in household wealth. And there's a whole structure for how they do that today. And if you look at you know, equity, which is a way for companies to enable people to own the future cash flows of their companies in, you know, in the form of dividends and, and, and having a voice in those businesses through voting, like that's a model that works. The joint stock corporation, the evolution of that, that's a model that works. Um, and there are capital markets for that that are today fairly narrow, right? It's only the largest businesses in the world that can participate in them. It, I, I like to use the example of um, in the early days of the internet, if you wanted to like reach a global audience with an advertisement, you needed to like spend like a hundred million dollars on a whole bunch of stuff that reached these big broadcast channels. And then long tail ad, long tail advertising markets places emerge where like anyone could reach anyone with a directed advertisement super efficiently with incredible cost efficiency. And that was transformative. Um, for commerce. And I think that that's the kind of change I would like to see and that we think is possible in, in capital markets. And what that should mean is that businesses and households can more efficiently deliver capital and borrow capital and, and do that more directly with fewer intermediaries and lower cost and, and better risk management that ultimately delivers you know, growth into the economy, right? That, that's what you're looking for from this. And so it is sort of saying the public internet and this public infrastructure and this, this resilient global decentralized infrastructure can do it better. It can do it better than the infrastructure that we have today. And I think the internet has proven that over and over and over and over again, that it can do it way better, you know, 10X, 100X, whatever you want to use as, as your metaphor. So I think it can do it way, way better. Um, long way to go <laughs> still. So, I mean, I mean, basically, that's a, a, a broadening in some ways of, you know, Mark Cuban in his open letter a couple of weeks ago, he wrote that this could be the next great American growth engine. It sounds like that's that's basically what you're what you're pointing to. Well, I mean, I, I look at this as public blockchain infrastructure 
and all the all the things being created on top of that, everything from the digital commodity assets that fuel it to you know stablecoin assets to tokens more broadly that can be used for a variety of things. I, I look at all of this as basically building a new global economic infrastructure from the ground up natively on the internet and envisioning a, a, a global economic system that is actually operated entirely in that quote unquote digitally native form and, and mediated by software on the internet on these open networks. And that, that is, I think, where the destiny of the world. And I think that's what's happening here. Um, and we're, we're in whatever stage of that you, you want to call it, just like the world of information and data and communications has been completely subsumed by the internet um, and computing. Um, this is just the natural evolution of that to gobble up a really important set of information systems, which happen to be markets. Let's zoom out now, I guess, or let's zoom forward to the next 12 to 18 months or whatever the right period is. Um, you kind of mentioned one of the key things that needs to happen is figuring out how uh, the traditional financial landscape, particularly as it relates to identity and compliance, can plug in with the infrastructure that's being built. So that's obviously one thing. We can go more into that if you want. But what are other important catalysts yeah. you see over the next period? What are what are things that you either think you, you see coming down the pipeline or that you think should be uh, should be kind of have, have emphasis on them? It's a great question. Um, we, we touched a little bit on some of this earlier in that generally scaling infrastructure is just a huge one. And, 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 and that's basically third generation blockchain technology in the form of layer ones and layer twos that are designed for you know, being able to run an actual capital market on it, being able to run consumer scale payments throughput, that kind of thing. So that's that's big, that's happening. That's gonna be a story of the next 12 to 18 months is like I proverbially use, they're going from dial up to broadband. And if you remember that transition from dial up internet to broadband, there were multiple stages along the way. There was something called ISDN, which was still using your copper wires in your house from your phone to deliver higher speed, but it was kind of like 10 times faster than your dial up modem. That's kind of what second generation chains are like. And now we're going way higher throughput. So that's a big thing. That's like just a general core kind of almost like CapEx expansion, like building out this infrastructure. So that's huge and important. The, the, the second piece, which is like something that you, you raised and, and we had touched on, which is solving the problem of how kind of real world entities, individuals, firms can... Um, disclose themselves safely in a privacy preserving manner to these protocols, to these markets, and for the protocols and the markets themselves to be able to know a real world identity versus an anonymized identity and enable markets and liquidity pools and other things to, to, to support that in, in a native way. That has to happen. That really is critical to truly opening this up to all businesses in the world and all households in the world and, and so on. And I think there's a path there, um, which, which we're really excited about. The, the next piece is part of introducing identity is also about introducing reputation. You know, we have reputation in the financial system today in the form of credit scores. In fintech, you have, you know, AI-based reputation, AI signals that are making underwriting decisions and so on. Connecting all of that into DeFi, enabling lending, for example, to happen not just for people who have a bunch of Bitcoin that are going to over collateralize and borrow on margin, but actually enable a market to price risk on an unsecured loan and, and have that be delivered you know, th through these markets. That kind of thing, I think is really important. And then maybe the third thing is beginning the process of bridging between other quote unquote real world assets and digital assets. And so enabling equity or property to be tokenized and be made available to transact in these decentralized markets. I think that represents ultimately an enormous, enormous opportunity for how, how big this, this kind of infrastructure can be. I mean, I guess that's maybe a, a good question to just think as, as we zoom kind of as far out as possible. Right now, these rails are being built largely to um, facilitate interesting types of exchange yield generation around a specific new type of digital asset that has right. emerged over the last few years. 
to what extent in the long run is the real destiny of DeFi to be about a reimagining of uh, basically markets infrastructure through which any types of assets that can be represented digitally get put pushed through? I mean, that's where it has to go. That's where I think it's going. And that's where I think it has incredible impact. Like right now, the 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 universe of tradable instruments are the universe of 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 tokens and the universe of tokens are mostly tokens of crypto native protocols or projects and stable coins and and crypto commodity assets like a bitcoin and so on like that's the universe right but the universe of theoretical tradable financial instruments is is nearly infinite and i look at innovations like what a uniswap or a sushi swap and and, and all these types of DEXs have done is they've they've solved something that has not been solved in classical uh, 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 markets, which is how can you create a way for an instrument that is a very illiquid instrument to actually have price discovery and have an incentive system for liquidity around something that is smaller in scale. And so this is, you know, these new tokens get launched and there's a liquidity pool and there's AMMs and there's an incentive. And actually you can get price discovery and liquidity on that in these DEXs. That's, that's a breakthrough from my perspective, because if you think about, you know, today, just take equity, right? The vast majority of equity in companies is not tradable. It's not even close. The vast majority of equity is in private corporations it's in the vast numbers of small and medium enterprises, startups, et cetera. And what if you could enable a slice of that private equity in startups, in growth companies, and all these things to be tokenized and have liquidity pools and automated market makers and find liquidity and distribution in a capital market like that? That's extraordinarily powerful. And I think it's that democratization of financial market infrastructure that this represents and its application to many, many, many other types of assets beyond just native crypto tokens as we think of them today. So that I want to hang on that word democratization as we close out uh, with just a couple minutes left. How do we ensure, if this is really a reimagining of the financial plumbing that allows for this sort of, uh, you know, a new growth engine, a new wealth you know, kind of creation opportunities, how do we make sure that those benefits aren't just captured by you know, the, the sort of limited few or the, the people who are already in positions of power in capital markets now? Is that, is that the destiny of it to just kind of port one set, you know, power structure yeah. over to a new? I, I, mean, I, I certainly hope not. I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the internet has democratized a lot of things and, and we can argue about whether it's created super platforms, centralized, super powerful platforms like Google and Facebook and, and the like. But what I, what I would say is, is it has enabled dramatically more voices to be able to communicate, dramatically more creators of content to distribute it. It's created a world where a small creator of a small product that's in some distant land can find a buyer in Cincinnati and, and, it, and it's an efficient market, it's a global market. It's done that and that, that is democratizing. Um, that is democratizing of information and communications and of media and of artistry and of being an artist and of, and of being a creator of products. It's been just totally democratizing. And so I just inherently believe that these internet-based platforms, in particular, this, this form of decentralized financial market infrastructure is going to be as democratizing to capital um, as uh, the, the rest of the internet has been to these other things. Super exciting, Jeremy. This is a really, really fun topic, really fun conversation. Uh, any, any last thoughts before we wrap? No, I'm good. Always a pleasure. Ex exciting, uh, exciting times right now. Yeah, excited to check back in on this in a few months too and see where we are now. All right, Jeremy, thank you so much for your time. And to everyone watching, really appreciate you hanging out. We'll catch you soon.